Hi there! Now since I started posting my knitting on Instagram and on YouTube, I've had a lot of DMs from people who ask me, if you want to learn to knit, where should you start? They want to make clothes, but they're scared of starting on a pattern because it's not always entirely clear what abbreviations mean, and they just want some advice on where I learned to knit and how I started. So I've given advice, um, but also I really wanted to sort of contribute something myself to the beginner knitting uh, resources. And so today I am bringing you a video where I will show in full how to make this jumper. It's a little hard to show, but if I put it on I'm going to boil to death. This jumper has a written pattern which you will find linked in the description. It uses abbreviations like a regular knitting pattern, but everything is also explained in a little bit more detail than it usually would be, so I think it is completely beginner friendly. Additionally, the entire process and all the techniques used will be explained and shown in this video, so if you get stuck in any part of the pattern, you can check back here, or if you get stuck on any part of the video, you can check the written pattern. This is a very simple, plain jumper, um, with a pretty flattering fit, and with no complicated techniques. I have also written up stitch counts for a few different sizes, so if you are a different size to me, there should also be some stitch counts and stuff in the written pattern so that you can knit it in your own size, along with additionally instructions for choosing which size to knit. This jumper is knit top down and it is seamless, so there are no seams anywhere, it is knitted in the round, um, and so you can try it on as you go to figure out lengths that suit you and fit the style you're going for. It should also be quite a fast knit on large needles, and I think that's about all I have to say about it. So with that, let's get on with the video. In order to show the different possibilities for jumpers you can make with this pattern, I did knit up this second sample using a totally different yarn. It also has a folded neckline and some additional short row shaping around the neckline, which helps it sit more comfortably. This is slightly more advanced. However, I have still included it in the pattern and also in this video. If you're interested in the folded colour or the short row neckline shaping, these are included in additional sections at the end of the video, as well as a section on the stripes in the grey sample, and some notes on weaving in ends and joining on new balls of yarn. So yes, this is my Noro 10 end sample. Maybe I made the sleeves a little bit long, but I think it's really cute too. Okay, so before we start, let's go over the materials you're going to need. Firstly, let's talk briefly about the yarn. The yarn that I'm using here is called Drops Nepal, and I chose it because it's a pretty nice natural fibre yarn that's also very affordable. The other reason I chose it is it's a little bit thicker than most yarns that I work with, so it'll be a faster knit, which I think is really helpful for your first project. I will have some yarn alternatives that I will show you in just a minute for some fluffier options or some more affordable options, but this is, I think, a really good yarn to start off with. One colour is fine, I'm going to do stripes, so I have two colours here, a light grey and a cream. Now let's talk briefly about the other materials that you're going to need. This is my knitting case, and inside it I keep pretty much all of the materials and things I need to work on a project like this. So let's talk first of all about needles. This project is knitted on circular knitting needles. This basically allows you to knit in a spiral so you can make a tube without any seams in it, which is how we create the body and the sleeves and the collar and all that kind of stuff. There are two types of circular knitting needles, really. This is a regular uh, fixed circular needle. You'll see that this cable between the two needles is attached onto the needle itself. This can't be removed. You have to buy them in lots of different lengths, working on different parts of the jumper, as well as having different needle diameters. This is the other option. These are interchangeable circular needles. So you can see these are similar, apart from they don't have the cable attached onto them. Instead, they have this little screw here. And inside this pouch here, I basically have a whole bunch of different lengths of cable, and then these just screw onto the needles like so. It basically means you end up having to buy fewer needles. So if you're just going to make one jumper and that's it, it might be cheaper to just buy all of the different fixed circular needles the project is going to require. And I will show you some sort of tips to make it so that you don't need quite so many different cable lengths. However, if you're going to work on multiple projects, it might make sense to buy a set of interchangeable needles like this. They start off fairly cheap. I believe Drops has a set of metal interchangeable needles that costs around £20. You may also be able to find some second-hand sets. They do go up to be very expensive. A lot of sets sort of in the 
one to 200 pound range. You're also going to need a pair of scissors, something that's sharp enough to cut your yarn. And you're going to need a needle like this for weaving in ends. I'll mention it in the pattern, but you may want some shorter circular needles as well for knitting smaller diameter stuff like sleeves, but it's actually not necessary because you can use a certain technique to allow you to use these longer needles for those too. You're going to need a tape measure. If you don't have a tape measure, you can totally make do with a piece of yarn and a ruler. And... But if you have a tape measure, that's pretty convenient. You're going to need some scrap yarn. This will be used to hold your stitches when you remove the needles and allows you to try the project on as you go along. Because the coolest thing about a top-down jumper is you can take it off and try it on and knit a bit and keep on going and figure out the lengths and stuff that way, rather than having to just follow the pattern and measure them. And I'll show you how to do that. You can buy these sort of dedicated plastic cables that you can keep your stitches on when you remove the needles, but some scrap yarn will work fine. You can use whichever yarn it is you're using for your project. Um, that will work just fine. If you are using interchangeable needles, some extra things that you might find useful are these little stoppers. You can pretty much remove the needle from the end of the cable and put these stoppers on instead, which again can allow you to try the clothing on or whatever. Again, not essential. Um, probably will come with your set if you buy a set of interchangeable needles, but it could be useful. The final thing that you're going to need are some stitch markers. You can find a lot of really cute stitch markers, especially on Etsy and things. I have these little gold ones with some sort of semi-precious beads on them. Having something this fancy is completely unnecessary. You can buy plastic locking stitch markers, like you would use for crochet, they work too. But really, when it comes to knitting, there are a lot of things you'll find around your house that will probably work just fine as stitch markers. You could use a ring, like a piece of jewelry. Um, you could use some small hoop earrings, that'd be fine. It doesn't have to be able to open. If you really don't have anything else, I'll see if I can find a little scrap long enough. You can take a little piece of yarn like this, and just tie a knot in it, and then I will trim off these ends here, leaving enough length that it doesn't come undone. And then this will work totally fine as a stitch marker. Basically, as you knit, um, you just slide it over your needle like this in between the stitches. Um, you'll see when we start working on the project. You're going to need nine stitch markers, and I would suggest that one of them is different from the others in some way. So you could have one that's a different color to the other eight, or for mine, one of the beads is slightly larger than the other. This will be used to mark the beginning of the round, whereas the other eight will be used to mark where you will do the increases and decreases. I think that's about it, and that should be enough to get started on the project. So let's talk alternative yarn. My original gray and white stripe sample is knitted in this yarn. This is Nepal by Drops, which is very widely available and also extremely budget friendly. This is an iron weight yarn. I'd say it's quite a chunky iron weight yarn. Drops actually do another yarn called Alaska, which is similar and even cheaper. So you could use that too. And Drops yarn very often goes on sale for 30 or 40% off too. I tried to pick a selection of alternative yarns at varying price points and also available in different regions. There are a list of similar weight yarns that you can meet the same gauge with, at least, in the pattern um, as alternatives for this. I have a few of them here, but some of them I don't have here, so do check the pattern. I think I mentioned Cascade Ecological or Cascade Eco Plus, um, if you can get Cascade yarns in your country, especially in the US. I also mentioned this one from Sandness Garn. This is a little bit thicker. It's called Fritted's Garn and it's a very rough sort of hard wearing yarn. It's quite affordable. You can meet gauge with this yarn, I think. So this would also be an option. If you want something with a totally different texture, this yarn is also from Sandness Garn. It's called Cos and it's a blow yarn. So it's like a little net with these really soft alpaca fibers blown through it. This will create a really luxurious and soft jumper, and you can meet gauge with this too. There are cheaper alternatives that are similar to this yarn, such as I think Drops do one called Drops Air. A lot of brands do a similar yarn to this. I know we are knitters have been a little bit controversial lately, um, but this is another yarn that you can meet gauge with. This is the We Are Knitters Ecolana 100% wool, and it comes in a few different natural colors. I think this is the black color, but it's really more of a dark brown. And some people I know really like the look of these sort of single ply yarns, even though they're not my favorite. Now, another option instead of knitting with one heavier iron weight yarn is you can knit with two different strands of yarn held together. An option would be to knit with a worsted weight yarn held with a mohair. So my second sample is knitted in this. This is 
Tenen by Noro, which is a Japanese brand. This is a very interesting textured yarn with lots of different colours and thicknesses in it. And then I held it with one strand of mohair. This here is the Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair. I just grabbed a random mohair. This is my favourite mohair yarn to use. I think it's very soft, but if you don't mind having a slightly rougher texture, I think you can get the Drops Mohair for pretty much half the price, even when it's not on sale. That is called Drops Kid Silk. There are a few other options that you can use as your worst of weight yarn held with mohair for this pattern. This one here is the Heavy Merino by Knitting for Olive. I think this colour is called Mushroom Rose, but off the top of my head, some other possibilities that are a similar weight include Phil Kalana Peruvian Highland Wool, which is very affordable and very nice, Cascade 220, which comes in so many colours and is again pretty affordable. Any of those would work great held with a mohair as well. However, as usual with all of these, their thicknesses do vary slightly, so you will need to gauge swatch and see if you need to go up or down a needle size, depending on both the thickness of the yarn and the tension that you knit with. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do a gauge swatch. This, for this project specifically, is going to serve two purposes. Firstly, it's going to be great practice. You can learn how to knit stockinette, which is the sort of fabric that the jumper's going to be knitted in, and it's not going to be there in the final piece, so if you mess up a little bit, it doesn't matter. We're also going to learn useful skills like casting on and casting off if you haven't already. If you are comfortable with doing a gauge swatch, feel free to skip this section. The second and maybe more important purpose is it's going to help figure out if the jumper is going to fit. Some people knit more tightly than others, or your yarn may be slightly bigger or slightly smaller, and so your knitting may end up coming out as a slightly different size. So the purpose of this is we can knit a little square, measure it, see how many stitches fit into a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter square, and then use that to check if the pattern gauge matches the gauge of the swatch. I'm going to move the camera around so that you can see what I'm doing a little bit more easily. So I'm going to show you these two different methods for casting on. The first one I don't especially recommend. The second method is my recommended method. However, while the second method is better, and I'll talk more about that when I get up to it, this first method is easier. So if you are really stuck on the second method, this is like your backup one. I'm going to start off with a slip knot. So I'm just going to make a loop and then bring this around like I'm going to tie a knot, but I'm not going to pull it all the way through. And you don't need to leave a very long tail, just enough to weave in. You put the loop onto the needle and pull it tight. Okay, so this is called the backwards loop cast on. And even if you don't end up using this to cast on the jumper, you will use it in the underarm section because it's a very good technique for casting on stitches in the middle of a row. So here's how it works. You're going to make a loop like this. See how this comes over? And then we're just going to put it onto the needle and pull it tight. Making the loop again, like so. Put it onto the needle and pull it tight. Now, the problem with this cast on is the first round that you knit is going to be really difficult to knit. I only have four stitches, but I will show you. If I knit this first stitch, you'll see that it all sorts of stretches out it's very hard to get my needle through this second loop and you end up with this great long string between the stitches. It'll also give a less even look to your finished cast on edge than the second method. So let's try the second method. This one doesn't have to be started with a slip knot. I actually do because I don't find that it's very visible, but you can just start it by looping the yarn around the needle too. This is called the long tail cast on and I use it for almost everything if it's not in the middle of a row. So what I need to make clear is that this front strand of yarn is the tail and you need to leave this long. What you can do to estimate how long is wrap the yarn around the needle the number of times that is the number of stitches you want to cast on. So if you want to cast on 20 stitches, wrap around the needle 20 times. That's a pretty good estimate of how long you want this tail to be. And then this back tail is attached to the ball of yarn. So you need to make sure that this long tail for your long tail castle is in the front and the ball of yarn is in the back. Now we need to hold these strands in quite a specific way. So what you're gonna do is you're going to, this is my middle finger and my ring finger. I'm going to grab the two strands with my middle finger and my ring finger. And now I'm going to use my point finger and my thumb and insert them between the strands and pull them apart. So this one 
is the one that's the long tail and this one is attached to the ball of yarn. I'll do that again. I'm going to grab the two strands with my middle finger and my ring finger and then I'm going to use my pointer finger and my thumb to separate the two strands with the long tail in front. Now watch this very carefully and I warn you this is probably the hardest part of this entire jumper if you're not doing the short rows. So if you find this tricky, watch some other YouTube videos, see if they explain it better. And if you can't do it, don't get discouraged, just do the other cast on. Anyway, I'm going to reach down and use my needle to grab this strand that's in front of my thumb from bottom to top. Now I'm going to use my needle to grab this strand that's around my pointer finger, around the front again, but this time from back to front. And now I'm going to use my thumb to lift this loop off the needle. So only this one we just grabbed is left on my needle. I'm going to pull it tight. So I'm going to do this a few more times so as you can see. I'm going to grab the strand in front of my thumb from bottom to top. I'm going to grab the strand over my pointer finger from back to front. And then I'm going to take the loop over my thumb off the needle and pull it tight. You want to make sure that the stitches are pretty much evenly spaced on your needle as you do this. I'll do it again from bottom to top, from back to front, and then you take the loop off the needle. This makes the first round much easier to knit and I think it gives quite a nice looking finished edge. If you are knitting flat, um, you know that the first row is going to be a wrong side row and this is the right side. Okay, so here I am with my 25 stitches on my needle. I'm just going to turn it around. So the needle with the stitches on it is in my left hand because this is how we knit normally. And then I'm just going to grab the other needle in my right hand. You see the needles are connected by cable. For this gauge swatch specifically, it doesn't really matter how long the cable is because right now we're going to be knitting flat. So I'll just show you how to do a knit stitch. Again, feel free to skip this if you're comfortable knitting and purling. The key about knit stitches, I suppose, is that they look different from the front and the back. So here are knit stitches on the front, and then here are the back of them, which you can see has a sort of bumpy finish. When you're working in the round, like if you're working on a jumper sleeve of the body, which is what we're going to be doing most of the time, you can do knit stitches all the time because the outside of the tube is always going to be front facing. If you're knitting a piece flat though, we're going to work on the front and then along the back. And so you have to do knit stitches on the front and purl stitches when you're on the back. Finally, this ribbing that we use for the collar and cuffs is made of alternating knit and purl stitches. So first of all, let's do a row of knit stitches. You want to take your right hand needle and insert it into the stitch from the left to the right, like so. Now grab your tail and wrap it over that back needle like so. So around the back and then over the top. Now we're going to pull this needle in my right hand out of the stitch, but we're going to make sure that it's still catching this yarn over like so. And finally, you can let the original stitch here slip off the left needle. And that is a knit stitch, so I'll do a few more so you can see. Insert it from left to right, wrap around the yarn, pull the old stitch off the right needle, and then drop it off the left needle too. This can be really fast once you get the hang of it. So I'm just going to keep doing that as I work along this row. I'm very sorry if you can hear my needle cable tapping my tripod, that is very irritating, I know. Okay, so I've gone along all 25 stitches, and now I'm going to put this back into my left hand, because like I said, the stitches that you haven't knit yet, you always want to have on the needle in your left hand. And we're now going to start working over these stitches again. However, we're now working on the wrong side. You can tell from this little row of bumps at the base of all of the stitches, this means you're on the wrong side. Whereas ignoring the bumps on the cast on edge, um, it's a little hard to see, but there's a sort of V shape here like this, which you can see is what the right side of your knitting looks like. So essentially what we're doing here is like a backwards knit stitch. So the stitch that we do will look like this, but on the other side, it'll look like a regular knit stitch. So let's purl. To purl, you want to insert your needle from right to left into that first stitch. Now you want to yarn over in the same way. And I will say, this is one of the most common mistakes that people make while they're knitting. If you look on like the knitting subreddit, it's full of people who are making this mistake for one of their first knitting projects. So really concentrate to make sure that you wrap the yarn around the needle the correct direction when you're purling. So after inserting it from right to left, we're going to again put the yarn under the needle and then back up and over it like this. And then again, I want to pull this out while keeping the yarn over. So that loop is still on the right hand needle. 
and now I can let this stitch drop off my left needle. Okay, let's do it again. I insert from right to left, wrap the yarn under and up, And again, this is pretty much just as quick once you get the hang of it. So let's just go along this row and purl all of these stitches. Okay, so I've gone along. You can see the two rows of bumps here. And I'm now going to flip that over again to the smooth side with the Vs. This is the right side, so the next row is going to be a knit row. Let's go along these stitches again and knit. And basically, I'm going to repeat this, doing a knit row and then a purl row and so on, until I have sort of a little square of fabric. I will come back before then because, like I said, I want stripes on my jumper, so I will just show you the colour change, even though it's not very complicated. I have done a couple more rows and I now want to switch to the other colour. I'm not really going to overcomplicate this. Essentially, I'm just going to trim this attached yarn. I'm going to make sure that the tail is long enough to weave in afterwards to stop it from unravelling. Then I'm going to grab my new ball of yarn. Can you tell if this is a right side row or a wrong side row? It's a right side row. So we're going to be doing knit stitches. I'm going to go as if I'm going to do a knit stitch. I'm just going to keep a hold of this to stop it from loosening too much. Basically, I'm just going to start knitting with this new piece um, like it's already attached to the work, even though it's not. So I'm just going to hold that tail behind the work and pretend that this is the attached gray yarn and knit as normal. Now you'll notice this first stitch is really sort of loose and ugly looking, but if I pull the ends it becomes tight and looks good. Basically once I'm done with this you can weave these ends in and pull them taut to make it look neat, but for now just sort of ignore it. And now I can just carry on with my new colour. If you want to knit the jumper with stripes on, when you're working flat like this it's easy, but when you're working the round, like we will for most of the jumper, you'll find there'll be a little step where you start a new round. So I'm going to put a little section at the end of this video in an appendix where I explain how to make that less noticeable. So if you do want to knit your jumper with stripes, I would suggest checking that out. Anyway, I'm going to knit a bit more and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so the swatch is looking pretty nice. One of the nice things about swatching like this is it lets you test out your colours, see if they look good together. I quite like these low contrast stripes, but also I like the six row wide stripe. I think that's a nice width and will look good on the jumper. You'll notice though that this edge curls up very easily. This is really just sort of inherent to this type of fabric, which we call stockinette or stocking stitch if you're British. It will just roll up, which is why when you have a jumper, you will notice that the edges are never made of this type of stitch. They have this ribbed section. It adds a bit more elasticity, but also it does stop the edges from rolling up. Unless that's the look you're going for, you know. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do a bit of ribbing on the end of this swatch to show you how much more it lies flat and also make sure that you're comfortable with it because it's the last really type of stitch you're going to need. And since you already know how to knit and know how to purl, ribbing should be easy. So when you're knitting normally, if you're going to do some ribbing, you want to go down a needle size. I've been using 5.5 millimeter needles for this, so I'm just going to subtract one millimeter and go for 4.5 millimeter needles. These ones are my 4.5 millimeter needles. Now, if you're using interchangeable needles, you may just be able to unscrew your needle and screw on the other one. Actually, mine have different joint sizes for the 4.5 and 5.5 millimeters, so I can't do that. But this is also helpful because I'll show you any of you guys who are using fixed circular needles how to do it. I'll just stick a cable on these to start. Again, I'm knitting flat, so it doesn't really matter which length of cable I'm going for here. Okay, so basically I want to move from these needles to these needles. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to knit another row like I would normally, but instead of knitting it onto the other end of... It doesn't help that my cables are clear so you can't see them. Instead of knitting them onto the other 5.5mm needle, I'm just going to knit them onto this 4.5mm needle. This is the wrong side, so this is going to be a purl row. So I'm just going to go ahead and purl them. Okay, so I've removed my old needles, they're onto this new smaller needle. And that means that I'm ready to start doing ribbing. I will say if you're wanting to switch to doing ribbing and you have the interchangeable needles, and so like I said, you can just 
unscrew the old needle and screw on the new needle. I would suggest starting off by knitting a row on the new size needle before you start doing the ribbing anyway. But regardless, now we're ready to do it. Basically, ribbing is really simple. You know how to knit, you know how to purl. Ribbing is alternating a knit and a purl. So the first stitch we're going to do is a knit stitch and we're going to do it just like before. So I don't think I made this very clear before, but when you're knitting, you're going to be holding the yarn behind the work. When you purl, you're going to be holding it in front. So I'm starting off with it behind and I'm going to insert the needle through from left to right, like I did before when I was knitting, wrap the yarn like I did before when I was knitting, and so. And now ready to purl, I'm going to bring the yarn up between the needles so that now it's in front. And that means I'm ready to purl, so I can go ahead and insert it from right to left, fit around, over and through like I did before when I purled, and once again bring the yarn back behind, ready to knit. Knit again, bring it through, purl, and so on. Now, what you'll notice is that if you look closely at these stitches, you'll see some of them have this little, I've heard people calling it a scarf, which is quite cute. So this stitch here, this one here, and this end one, they have this little scarf wrapped around them, whereas these ones don't. The ones with the scarf wrapped around are the ones that you purled. This can be useful if you can't remember what the next stitch is going to be. So you can see this guy has his little scarf. That was a purl. This one's going to be a knit. I'll just finish off this row. Okay, so I've gone all the way across and I'm again going to flip my work and work on the other side. Now you might be wondering which stitches do I knit this time and which ones do I purl? And you'll have to ignore all these purl bumps from the previous rows, but essentially the idea is if the stitch has a scarf like this one and like this one and so on, they'll be the ones you purl and these ones without scarves, these will be the ones you knit. So I knit the last stitch of this row. It doesn't have a scarf on the front, but it does have a scarf on the back. So on this side, I'm going to purl it. So just untangle. I will purl this first stitch. And then you'll see this next stitch does not have the little scarf around it, so this one is going to be a knit. This one does, so this one's the purl, and so on. And I'm just going to keep on doing rows like that until I have a little section of ribbing. It is very exciting <laughs> to watch the ribbing come together. Okay, so if I just open this out, you can see the ribbing really starting to come together. Ribbing can look a little bit messy, this does. If you feel like yours is looking too messy, um, you can go down another needle size. To be honest, I don't mind this, so I think I'm just going to leave it how it is. I'm now going to show you how to cast off, and there are, again, like with the cast on, a couple different techniques for casting off. One's a bit more complicated, one's a bit easier, and the easier one I'm going to show you now, it is less elastic. So again, you need to make sure that you're doing it quite loosely so that you can get the jumper over your body and over your hands and all that. I won't show you the other cast off now, but when I am casting off the actual finished jumper, I'll show you the proper cast off. So if you struggle with that, you can come back to this section and see the easier cast off. Besides, the cast off on our swatch doesn't have to be super elastic, so what does it really matter? So basically, we're going to knit and purl like we would if we were just carrying on in ribbing. This first one is a purl stitch, so I'm going to do that. And then the second stitch is a knit stitch. When you have two stitches on your right hand needle, what you're going to do is you're going to use your left needle to carefully pick up the second stitch. I mean second stitch from the, the point of the needle, it's the first stitch that you knitted. And I'm going to slide it off the needle, and you want to keep this stitch here on the needle, so it's going to go over that stitch and off the needle. And that stitch is now cast off. So now uh, I'm going to purl the next stitch, you can see it has the little scarf right here, it's a purl stitch, so I'm going to go ahead and purl it. And again, I have two stitches on the right hand needle, so I'm going to pick up this stitch and lift it over the other one and off the needle. And this next stitch is a knit stitch, so knitting that and lifting this one again over and off the needle. I'm just going to carry that on until I reach the end of the row. I have one stitch left on my left needle, it's a purl stitch, so I'm just going to purl it and again lift this stitch off the needle. So this edge is now bound off and I have one stitch left. I'm just going to gently pull on it to leave a big loop and remove my needle. 
And then I'm going to cut this tail. This is the one that's attached to the ball. Again, I'm going to leave enough length to weave the end in. And I'm just going to grab it through the loop and pull it tight. So there we go, there is the ribbing. Here is our finished swatch and you can see that this edge is not rolling up like this one is. So if you can visualize this could be, you know, the cuff of your jumper with a ribbed edge and that's going to look nice and be a little stretchy. Now, one of the main purposes of swatching, like I said before, was to check that you match the gauge of the pattern. Now, when you're wearing your jumper, you're likely going to wash it a few times and depending on the stitch you're using and the fiber of the yarn you're using, uh, the fabric can grow quite a lot when it's washed. So what we're going to do is wash this swatch just like we will wash the actual jumper and let it dry just like you let the actual jumper dry and then we're going to measure the gauge after that so we can check that our finished washed jumper is going to match the gauge of the pattern. So in terms of how to wash this, the key when it comes to washing knitwear that's made of, I mean this is I think 65% wool, 35% alpaca, any kind of wool really, um, hand wash dry flat. You can buy wools that are super wash treated and these can be machine washed but I don't have much experience with them because I don't really like how they feel. If you want sort of a woolly, <laughs> wool feeling jumper, super wash probably isn't for you so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some water in a bowl or a sink or something. It doesn't have to be hot, um, just sort of room temperature, maybe slightly warm. We're going to put this in and soak it. Soak it for a few minutes, 20 minutes, it doesn't really matter too much. Then when we take it out, don't stretch it too much. You can gently squeeze the water out like this, but don't stretch it a lot or it might actually change the shape of the fabric. Then when it is soaked, I'm going to lie it down flat somewhere, ideally somewhere with some sun or whatever. Just sort of smooth it out. Um, it will not roll up so much as well because it will be wet and you'll be able to dry it a bit flatter. And I'm going to let it dry. Generally when you wet and dry knitting in this way, so you put it down wet somewhere and leave it out to dry, the shape that it dries in is the shape that it will stay in. So it does actually give you some control over the final shape of your garment. For example, this ribbing, you can see it sort of cinches in a bit. If I didn't like that, then when it's wet and sort of pliable, I could lay it out like this and it'll hold its shape a bit. And then when it dries, it'll sort of be set into that shape. So I'm just going to wash this, dry it overnight, and I'll be back again tomorrow to show you how to check the gauge. So let's talk about measuring gauge. I have my blocked um, gauge swatch here. I'm going to use my measuring tape, but honestly, a ruler might be better here because you can really put it down on the knitting and it will hold the knitting flat and stop it from moving about while you're counting. Basically, what you want to do is just place it down and then you want to count the number of these Vs, columns of Vs, that fit into 10 centimeters width. So I'm gonna start counting here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 Vs which is what the pattern says. You may have noticed it moved around a bit, it's kind of tricky to do while on camera, and I do recommend a ruler. You can also measure the row gauge by turning it around this way and counting how many of these Vs fit into 10 centimeters. The row gauge generally matters a little less. For this particular pattern, most of the measurements of sleeve length and body length are done based on number of centimeters rather than number of rows. So the only thing it really matters for is the yoke depth, and since the sweater is quite oversized anyway, I doubt that will be a problem. So I would advise you to mostly focus for this particular pattern on the um, number of stitches that fit into 10 centimeters this way. For other patterns though, that might not be the case. Okay, so let's talk about how to choose your size. I'm going to show you two ways to do it, and I'm going to be using this measuring tape. If you don't have a measuring tape, you can use a long piece of string or yarn and then just like mark it or cut it to length and measure it with a ruler afterwards. So this jumper is sized based on your bust measurement. So essentially you want to measure around the widest part of your bust. You don't need to pull it super tight and you don't want to be doing anything weird with your body while you're measuring. So don't, you know, wave your arms about or whatever. Just try and stand in a relaxed way, like so, a little bit of room. My bust measurement is around 83 centimeters. So I intended this jumper to have roughly 15 centimeters of positive ease. So what you need to do is add 
15 centimetres your bust measurement, so if your bust measurement is 83 centimetres, the resulting value is 98 centimetres, and then you need to choose the size which has a bust measurement closest to the resulting value. So for me, I would choose the size B, which has a 100 centimetre bust measurement, since that's closest to my 98 centimetres, which is equal to my bust measurement plus 15. The alternative way that you can do this, because you don't have to follow the recommended amount of ease given in the pattern. If I wanted a jumper that's super extra oversized, I could do that. If I wanted one that's a little bit more fitted, I could do that. What you can do instead is if you have a jumper that fits in the body the way that you would like it to, you can lay it down flat and measure across the sort of bust underarm point, measure the width of the jumper and double that to get your value. So just choose the size with measurement closest to double the width of a jumper that you already have with your preferred fit. Again, there are no rules. Feel free to size up, size down, whatever you want to do but that is my suggested way of choosing your size. Okay, so I'm going to make a start. I'm going to be casting on 68 stitches because I'm going to be making the size two. I'm going to use the long tail cast on. I would recommend trying this cast on if you can. Um, definitely if my explanation doesn't make sense, watch some other videos on how to do a long tail cast on and see if you can get one of them to work for you. I showed both of the methods for these two cast-ons in the section where I was showing you how to cast on with your gauge swatch. Okay, so 68 stitches, that's my first one. I'm using 4.5 millimeter, I think 40 centimeter cable needles here. Two, three, four. Okay, so I've cast on my 68 stitches. I use the long tail cast on, I do still have quite a lot of tail left. I did overestimate how much I needed. So I'm just going to cut it again, leaving enough to weave in. That way I don't get it mixed up with the end of it still attached to the ball. So I'm going to be knitting in the round. Since these are short circular needles, um, it's pretty easy to do. You want to spread your stitch out on the needle. As you can see, my needle's slightly too long, so I might switch the cable in a minute. This might be longer than 40 centimeters. I don't know, I grabbed it behind out of my back. And you want to make sure when you join it that this isn't twisted. So for example, if I join it like this, um, you see there's like a twist, then you'll end up knitting like some weird twisted tube and you'll have to start over. So make sure that the cast on edge isn't twisted. So like, we're going to join in the round and it's exactly how you think it's going to be. Just connect the two ends and start knitting. I'm going to put a stitch marker on first so that I know where the start of the round is. This will be the back of the neck. And because this is the collar, we're going to be starting off in ribbing. So I'm going to knit a stitch, purl a stitch, knit a stitch, this is always slightly annoying to do with the cast on edge, but once you've got past the first round, um, you will find it easier. Basically, I'm going to keep on doing this till I get round to the beginning of round marker. Then I will just slip the beginning of round marker onto my right needle and keep knitting. I'll show you when I get there. Okay, so I am almost all the way around. I have one more stitch before my beginning of round marker and it should be a purl stitch. So I'm just going to go ahead and purl it. And then I'm just going to pass my stitch marker from my left needle to my right needle, like so. Just make sure that it's out of the way of the yarn. And then keep going in a spiral, knit, purl, and so on. Knit, purl, knit, purl. Now you basically just want to keep on going like this, knit and purl alternating all the way around to create rib pass the stitch marker across when you get to the end of the round and keep on going till this distance here from the needle to the cast on edge measures about eight centimeters. Okay, so I've done about eight centimeters of rib. You can see what it looks like. As I mentioned before, you tend to use a smaller needle for rib. So on the next round, I'm going to switch to this 5.5 millimeter, 40 centimeter needle. And at the same time, I'm going to place all eight of my remaining stitch markers. The purpose of these stitch markers is to indicate where on the round we're going to be doing increases. So we're going to place them so that they separate panels for the front, back, and over the arms. 
Again, I'm going to be following the numbers for the size B, but in the description you can find numbers for a variety of sizes to fit different box measurements. Okay, so I'll just remove my beginning of round marker for now. Since I'm going to be changing needles, I'll add it back in at the end of the round. So I'm just going to knit these stitches straight from my 4.5mm left needle onto my 5.5mm new needle. I'm going to begin by knitting 13 stitches. Now, the place where we started was the centre back. So if I was wearing the jumper facing that direction, it would sit like this. This is the centre back, and so this part here is the right back. I'll place markers and then there'll be the part that goes over the right shoulder here, the front here, and the left shoulder here. Now, there are going to be two stitch wide sort of sections which we're going to increase around. So you're going to marker those off. So essentially you want to place a marker, knit two, and then place another marker. So these two stitches are sort of separating the back stitches from the right shoulder stitches. So now I will knit the stitches for the right shoulder. For a size B, that's uh, four stitches, I think. One, two, three, four. And then once again, I'm going to place markers around two stitches. Essentially, I'm going to continue going around and doing this. So I'm going to need to knit 26 stitches for the front, then separate off two more stitches for the rack length increases, then another four for the left arm, then separate another two, and then you should find that there are 13 stitches left to the beginning of round. Okay, so here I have it. This is the centre back and the marker here is the beginning of round marker, which mine has a slightly larger bead on, I think, differentiate it from the others. And then other than that, we have four pairs of markers. So we have 13 stitches and then a pair separated by two, four stitches and a pair separated by two, 26 stitches and a pair separated by two, four stitches, a pair separated by two, and then 13 more stitches to finish the round. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a two row repeat. So we're going to do one round where we place increases, and then a second round where we just knit all of the stitches, and we're going to repeat those two rows 23 times for the size B. So I'll show you how to do them. Basically we want to increase around each pair of markers. So from the beginning of round we're just going to knit to the first pair of markers. You want to stop before you slip the first marker in the pair. Now we're going to do a right leaning increase. Um, in a pattern, it's written M1R. So if you look, if we sort of pull the needles apart, you'll see that there's a bar here. You want to take sort of the top piece of yarn that goes between the two stitches. And we're going to want to insert our left needle into it from the back to the front. So just pick it up from behind. You can use your right needle to help you. You want to pick that bar up from behind on your left needle. And then basically you just want to knit that like it's a regular stitch. Then we'll slip the marker, knit the two raglan stitches. You always just knit the two stitches in between the marker without doing anything else to them. Slip the next marker. And now, because we're just outside that pair with markers around them again, we're going to do another increase, but this one is going to be left leaning or an M1L. So again, we see the bar, it's here, but this time you want to put it onto the left needle from front to back. So we're going to insert that left needle from the front. Now we're going to knit this stitch with a twist in it. So instead of inserting it from left to right, like we normally would, we're going to knit through the back loop. That means you, I'll just show you honestly, I think it's hard to explain this with words. So just watch what I do. I'm going to insert like this. Maybe it's easier to see from behind. From behind, I'm just going to insert my right needle into the stitch. like so. And then I'm just going to yarn over and knit it as usual. So I've basically just created a new stitch to the right of the marker here and a new stitch to the left of the markers here. I'll show you one more time. So we'll keep on knitting round to the next pair of markers all the way up to the first marker but don't slip it. This one is the M1R so I'm going to pick it up from back to front and then knit it normally. 
slip the marker, nip the two middle stitches as always, slip the marker, and now this one is going to be the left leaning increase. So this is then we're going to knit it in a weird way. So we're going to put it on the needle from front to back, and then insert the needle through the back loop and knit it twisted. So on the first round of these two rounds, you want to go around and do that to every pair of markers. You don't need to increase around the beginning of round marker, but you want to increase here and here as well to complete the round. And then after that, you want to do one round where you don't do any increases, just knit all the way around. I'm going to call these round one or row one and row two. You want to, for the size B, repeat them 23 times. So you do row one, row two, row one, row two, until you've done a total of 46 rows. You will start to see the raglan increases forming as you go. So uh, I'll be back then to show you what it's looking like. I should add again, if any of this is confusing to you, do check the written pattern, which we linked in the description, which will write all of this out like a proper knitting pattern. It's relatively self-explanatory and at the very least you can Google any techniques that appear. I've done a few rounds and you can see the increases here. These panels are getting larger and these are the two stitches between the markers. I thought I'd show you the rounds where no increases happen. So I mentioned, you know, every other round you just knit off stitches. So you can see I'm coming up to a pair of markers here. And this is an even numbered round, so it's a round with no increases. I'm just going to go ahead and knit up to the first marker. And this is the point where I would do the increase if I was on an increase round, but I'm not. So I just slip the marker, hit the next two stitches, slip the marker, and again, this is where I would increase if I was on an increase round, but I'm not, so I just keep knitting all the way around. And then once I get to the beginning of round marker, I'll begin an increase round again. As you can see, I've switched to bamboo needles again. As you increase more and you end up with more and more stitches on the needle, you can switch from the 40 centimeter 5.5 millimeter needles to a longer 5.5 millimeter needle. I think this one is 80 centimeters, um, but you can even go up to a 100 centimeter needle. So I have done my 46 rows, 23 rounds of increases on the yoke. I put it onto the longest cable I could find and it's still bunched up a little bit because there are just a lot of stitches on here. But I'm going to attempt to sort of try it on a bit before I separate the sleeves and body, the back. Not that it really matters. Okay, so it goes over my head okay. That's one important thing. Basically, I'm going to join it under the arm like this. I will be casting on a few more stitches um, down here under the arm. So if it's a little bit tight when you hold them together, that is okay. But yes, that's how it's going to go together. Okay, so in preparation for dividing the body and sleeves, I have cut two pieces of scrap yarn. The length doesn't matter too much, um, but these are going to hold the sleeve stitches. So you want it to go around your arm with a bunch of extra. Here is my finished yoke. So I'll just try to explain sort of what I'm attempting to do here. This is the center back, which is the beginning of the round. And basically I want to knit around the body stitches, but put the sleeve stitches onto the scrap yarn for later. So I'm going to knit up to this raglan uh, increase section. Then I'm going to remove all these stitches from my needle and put them onto the yarn, all the way up to the next set of raglan increases. Then I'm going to put all of these ones onto the needle, up to here. Then these ones onto scrap yarn, and then these ones are on this one for the needle. I'm also going to cast on a few extra stitches in the underarm, like I mentioned before. So the first step is to knit until you come up to the first set of increases. Okay, so I've got up to the first marker and I'm just going to remove this marker and then knit the two raglan stitches and remove the second marker. I'm just going to pull this needle through so it doesn't fall off while I'm putting these stitches on hold. And then I'm just going to take a needle, any needle that your yarn fits through is fine. And I'm going to use this to transfer all of these stitches onto the needle up until I get to the next marker. So I'm going to go like this and just keep on going until I reach the next marker. Okay, so I've reached this next marker. 
um, and I'm going to take it off and then pull this yarn through. Just going to take off the needle and then tie these ends together so that these sleeve stitches don't go anywhere. I'm basically going to leave these like this while I knit the body and then once the body's all finished I'll come back, pick these stitches up and knit the sleeve. So now I need to cast on stitches for the underarm and the number of stitches that you cast on varies with the size that you're knitting. For the size B I believe it is six stitches. So I don't know if you remember from the part where I was doing the gauge swatch I showed you how to do a backwards loop cast on. This is the cast on that we're going to use because it's pretty good for working in the middle of the row. So basically you just want to grab the yarn like this and place it over your needle and pull it tight. Make this loop again and just place it onto the needle and pull it tight. That's two, three, four, five and six. So now that I have the underarm stitches cast on I'm going to go on and um, put the front panel stitches onto this needle too. So basically I'm just going to continue knitting from here. I'll knit the first two stitches then remove the marker we're not going to be doing any more increases, so we don't need any of these markers anymore. And just keep on knitting. Essentially, when you get to the next set of markers over here, um, and you reach the other sleeve, we're going to do exactly the same thing again. You're going to remove the markers, knit the two raglan stitches, put all of the sleeve stitches on hold, cast on six stitches, and then knit around the other side again, back to the beginning of round. So I am back here at the beginning of round, and I'm going to go ahead and take off my beginning of round marker. I'm not going to put it away because basically I am going to set it aside for one minute and just knit until I come to these newly cast on underarm stitches. They look pretty funny right now, don't worry about it. They'll be a little tricky to knit on the first round but it'll look fine and it will all come together fine I promise. But basically when I get to midway through these underarm stitches I'm going to go ahead and put my beginning of round marker there. This is because the beginning of round is sort of like the messiest part and so you want it to be as hidden as possible. For the yoke of the jumper, um, the back of the neck is probably the best place, but now we can hide it under the arms and so we're going to do that. This should pretty much be where we're at now. I always feel like it's quite an exciting point, you know? Like, we have something that's topologically a sweater at least. You can see a collar, holes for the arms, and a hole for the body. Something like that. Anyway, the next step is super easy. Basically, you're just going to keep on knitting the body in the round, just knit in the spiral in stockinette, round and round, and keep on going until the body is about six to eight centimeters shorter than you want the jumper to end up being. That's because we're going to add ribbing on at the bottom, so you need to leave a little bit of room for that. But the length of your jumper is one of those things that a pattern can't really dictate to you. It's very up to personal preference. Even for one person, sometimes I like to have a shorter jumper that I'm going to wear over a dress, um, or a longer one that I'm going to wear with jeans. So just decide what you want it for. One of the nicest things about knitting a jumper in one piece top down like this is you can totally just try it on. Every time you want to try it on you can either put a really long cable or a stitch holder through or just thread all of the stitches onto a piece of yarn the same way that we did it here. And then you can just throw the jumper on, see if the length is where you'd like it to be. And I will see you again once the length of my jumper is about six to eight centimeters shorter than I want it in the end. Okay, hi. It is the next morning and I'm amazed at how fast this has knitted up. In 24 hours I've gone from just having this collar to having basically the entire body of the jumper done. I think I want it to be a little bit longer than this so this is the point where I'm going to stop with the stockinette and move on to knit ribbing. The jumper may end up growing a tiny bit when you wash and block it for the first time. It shouldn't be too dramatic just in stockinette and with this yarn so I wouldn't worry too much but always lean slightly on the side of it getting a little bit longer rather than getting shorter. So, in order to switch and do the rib, I am going to knit one round on 4.5mm needles, so you want to go down a needle size and just knit one round before you start doing ribbing, and then again on the 4.5mm needles, knit one purl one, all the way around. Just keep on, knit one purl one, just like we did for the collar, until the ribbing is the length that you want it. I like quite a chunky ribbing, so I think I might do about 8cm for mine. Although it is already getting a little bit long, so I might end up making it slightly shorter than that just so that the jumper isn't too long for my taste. It's totally a taste thing, and again, try it on when you think you're at the right point, um, and I'll be back afterwards to show you how to do a bind off which looks nice and is still quite elastic. So I've now knit the ribbing to the length that I want, and I'm going to bind off. I've stopped at the beginning of round marker, I'm just going to remove that. 
Now you can use the bind off that I showed in the section where we made the swatch at the start, but I also did say that I was going to show a different bind off. This one is definitely more time consuming and maybe slightly more difficult, but it will give a more elastic finish. So if you're doing this bind off with the bind off that I showed when making the swatch, you will have to try and do it as loosely as possible so that the jumper fits comfortably. Anyway, for this one, we're going to be doing it with a needle instead of with knitting needles. And the first thing that I'm going to do is trim um, the yarn, but I need to leave a pretty long tail. If the tail runs out, that's not a problem. You can attach more yarn and keep going, but um, I'm at least going to try to do it with one piece. And I'm going to thread it onto a needle. So um, we're going to be taking these stitches off the needle as we bind off. And the first thing I'm going to do is a sort of uh, set up stitch. I'm going to pretend that this is a knitting needle and I'm going to put this needle into this stitch as if I'm about to purl it and pull it all the way through. And now I'm going to insert the needle from the back in between these two stitches so it shouldn't pass through either of the stitches, it should just pass between them in this space here but from back to front. Like this. And then I'm going to insert my needle as if to knit into not this stitch at the end of the needle, but the second one along. So just sort of pretend it's a stitch on the end of the needle and go to knit it, pull through. And then the final uh, thing we're going to do here is knit the first stitch, but as we knit it, we're going to let it fall off the needle. So now the next section is uh, the steps that we're going to repeat as we go around the bottom jumper. So firstly, we're going to insert the needle into the second stitch as if we're going to purl it. That's not the one here, but the second one along um, and just leave it on the needle. And then we're going to purl into the first stitch. And as we do it, we're going to let this one fall off the needle. So insert the needle purl wise and pull the yarn through, letting it fall off the left needle. Then again, we're going to bring the needle from back to front between the two stitches. and insert knitwise into the second stitch. And then insert it knitwise into the first stitch and let it fall off the needle. So I know it seems complicated, but it's sort of a five step process. Purlwise into the second stitch, purlwise into the first stitch and drop it off. Pull the needle up between these two stitches, knitwise into the second stitch, knitwise into the first stitch and let it drop off. You can sort of um, replay this section of the video a few times until you get used to it, but it will feel quite natural. And I think also, as you're going around, what you'll notice is that the stitches that are purl stitches with the little scarf around the bottom, like this one here, these are stitches that will eventually be lifted off the needle um, as like you insert the needle purl wise and let them drop off. So this one, for example, is a purl stitch. I know it doesn't look like it because we've done some stuff to it, but this one is a knit stitch, so this one is a purl stitch. So I know that when this stitch is eventually cast off, it'll be one of the ones where you insert the needle purl wise and pull it off. So that's how you sort of catch on if you've messed up again. So I'll do the four stitches slowly so that you can see them and replay them and um, hopefully follow along. So we're going purl wise into the second stitch and through. Purl wise into the first stitch and off the needle. Bring it up between the first two stitches. Knitwise into the second stitch, leaving everything on the needle. And then knitwise into the first stitch and let it drop off the needle. And I'm just going to repeat this all the way around the bottom of the jumper to cast off the stitches. I am almost done with the bind off, so let's just finish it off. Uh, this one's a knit stitch, so I'm going to come forward from between those two stitches. Through the second stitch knitwise through the first stitch knitwise and slip it off, through the second stitch purlwise, through the first stitch purlwise and slip it off, from the back between those two, through the second stitch knitwise, through the first stitch knitwise and slip it off. Now we only have one more stitch left on the needle so we can't really continue. So I'm just going to sort of shove the needle through somewhere through here instead of going through the second stitch purlwise. And then to finish off, I'm going to go through this last stitch purlwise and slip it off the needle and then pull tight. 
there's almost a little step here in the bind off. Since this is under the arm, it's actually not the end of the world, but even so, when I weave in this end, I can sort of weave it through in a way that disguises it a bit and gives a more clean edge. You can see why this bind off is so appealing. It gives a pretty seamless looking finish and it allows a decent amount of stretch, so this jumper is going to fit really well. Now, the next step in the process is going to be adding sleeves. We left these stitches on hold earlier, and the first thing that I'm going to do is transfer the stitches from the yarn on which they're on hold to my 40 centimeter, 5.5 millimeter circular needle. So I'm basically just going to grab all the stitches and just have the needle follow the path of the yarn, like so. Now that I have all of the stitches on the needle, I'm just going to go ahead and cut the waist yarn and pull it out. Now, as you can see, this arm set of stitches that we picked up don't go all the way around because we cast on six stitches here in the underarm. The pattern says to pick up six stitches or however many you cast on um, in the underarm. And I'm going to show you how to do that now, but I will also show you a slightly better way of doing it. So first off, let's just talk about picking up stitches. To pick up stitches from a horizontal top edge of a piece of knitting, what you need to look for is these shapes that are like Vs, right? So this column here, where this is the top, is a column of Vs. We have a little V here, a V here, a V here, and so on. And so basically we want to insert the needle from front to back into the top of each column of Vs. And then you want to take your ball of yarn, this is attached, and wrap the yarn around the needle and then pull the needle back through so it has a loop over it. So I'm going to find the next column of V's which is just here. See these little V's and once again I'm going to insert my needle into the top and this is the end that's connected to the ball of yarn. Um, my short end is here in the back still and I'm just going to hold it out of the way. Wrap the end that's attached to the ball of yarn and pull it through and I'm going to repeat that six times And there we go, I have six stitches picked up, which is the number I'm supposed to have, and I can now pretty much just start knitting in the round. You will want to place a marker here in the middle of those six new stitches, because this will be the, where the beginning of round is. Now, the trouble with this method is that as I keep knitting, you'll notice there's quite a big gap, and there is an even bigger gap here. So as I knit these together and keep on knitting in the round, there's going to be a sort of hole in the armpit. Now, this really isn't a problem, because when you're done with the jumper, you can um, sew those holes up, and it's not an issue. But I am also going to show you a way that you can fix the holes now, so you don't have so much to do later. So I'm just going to lose all those stitches that I picked up, we're going to do it again. Now, I'm supposed to pick up six stitches, and I'm going to add four to that, and I'm actually going to pick up ten stitches. I'm just going to take my stitch markers. As well as the beginning of round marker for this, you're going to need two more markers. So, here's how it's going to work. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a stitch pretty close to where the right hand needle connects. I'm just going to go ahead and do it right here. Again, just going to wrap the yarn around the needle and then pull it back through so we have an extra stitch. And then I'm going to place my first stitch marker onto the needle. This is not the beginning of round marker, this is just a regular stitch marker. Then I'm going to go ahead and pick up a second stitch. Now I'm going to pick up six stitches just like I did before, and I'm going to place my beginning round marker after the third stitch. So let's do that. One, two, three, place the beginning of round marker. So at this point my camera and microphone still working, but basically what I'm saying is you pick up your last three stitches of the six stitches, and then you want to pick up one additional stitch, place your stitch marker, and then finally pick up one more stitch just like you did at the beginning of the underarm stitch picking up section. Finally, knit around until you are two stitches before the first marker that you placed. Okay, so I'm now two stitches before that first marker, and I'm going to do the first decrease. Basically, we're going to decrease before the first marker, after the first marker. We'll ignore the beginning of round marker for now, and then we'll decrease before the set second non-beginning of round marker and after the second non-beginning of round marker. To decrease, um, we're just going to do a knit two together because I feel like it's the easiest kind of decrease. Basically we're just going to treat these two stitches like they're one stitch. 
Insert the needle through both of them, like they're one single stitch and you're knitting it, and knit it. This looks quite loose because it's where we joined the yarn, so um, you'll see it tightens up if I just pull this yarn behind taut. I'm going to remove the marker and then do another knit two together. Then I'm going to knit to two before the next non-beginning of round marker. I'll just slip the beginning of round marker. And so here I am two stitches before it. I'm going to do a knit two together. Remove the marker and do one more knit two together. So you can see there's not really a big hole here and we do still have the right number of stitches. What I'm going to do now is just keep on knitting in spirals and stockinette until the distance from this underarm join to the working edge is about 10 centimeters. So this is the armpit cast on and I've knitted 10 centimeters from them. Now this next part is optional. If you want a straight sleeve with no decreases and a wider cuff, what you can do is just keep on knitting in stockinette, try it on, figure out the length, um, start the ribbing when you want to, do some ribbing, bind off. I'm going to do a few decreases in the arm. There are decreases written into the pattern. Now I'm going to show you what a decrease round looks like. We're going to do a decrease round now and then I'm going to decrease every 15th round until I've worked three decrease rounds in total. The first one, as I mentioned, is after 10 centimeters. So here's how we're going to do a decrease round. I'm just going to slip the beginning of round marker and then I'm going to knit the first stitch. Then I'm going to knit two together. We did a knit two together when we were doing the armpit. Um, basically, I'm just going to treat these two stitches as if they're one stitch, insert the needle like I would to knit one stitch, and knit them. So that's the knit two together. Now I'm going to carry on knitting until three stitches before the beginning of our marker. So I'm going to stop again when I get up to here. Alright, so you can see I have three stitches left until the beginning of round marker. I basically want to do the same thing as I did on the other side, where I did the knit two together here. But as you can see, a knit two together isn't symmetrical. The left stitch comes over the right stitch. So what I want to do here is something that's sort of the mirror image of the knit two together. So I'm going to do a slip slip knit, and here's how it works. I'm going to insert my needle like I'm about to knit, but I'm not going to wrap the yarn or anything. I'm just going to remove the left needle. So I've essentially just transferred the stitch from the left to the right needle, but I've twisted it. You can see normally the right hand leg of the stitch is in the front, but for this stitch the left hand leg is now in the front. So I'm going to do the same thing with the next stitch, insert knit wise and then remove the left needle so that the stitch is twisted. So I'm going to begin by transferring them to the left needle, and now I'm going to insert this just like this. You can see that? I'm putting it through the back loop, so I'm inserting it from the right to left. Yarn over, and knit. And you should be able to sort of see that this is the mirror image of this hip. Now I'm just going to continue knitting in stockinette, and I'm going to knit 14 more rounds of stockinette, um, since my size in the pattern says to decrease every 15th row, for a total of three decrease rounds. Once I've done with that, I'm going to try the jumper on, see how close it is to the, my desired sleeve length, and when I decide the length is appropriate, stop, switch to the smaller needle, knit one round, and then carry on in ribbing and bind off in the same way as I did for the body. Now as you work your way down the sleeve, it's quite possible you'll reach a point where there are really too few stitches on your needle to be able to comfortably knit it on a 40 centimeter needle. This might not be the case at all if you're knitting one of the larger sizes. For me, I'm just about to move on to the cuff, and I think now I want to move on to not using this needle anymore, because when I'm knitting, the stitches are quite stretched out, and it sort of, you see, deforms a bit here. There are sort of three ways to do this sort of small circumference knitting. The first is find a shorter circular needle. These do exist, but they're not so common, and generally I don't want to have to buy more needles. Another option is double pointed knitting needles. If you've ever seen somebody knitting a sock and they have about six needles sticking out of their work, uh, that's that. Uh, it looks terrifying. I personally find it annoying and tricky to do. The third option and the one I'm going to use is called Magic Loop. These are 80 centimeter needles. I'm actually switching to 4.5 mil ones just because this is the point in the cuff where I would do that anyway, but you can just take your uh, longer 5.5 mil needles as well. I'm one stitch off the beginning of round, so I'm just going to get to the beginning of round and then remove my stitch marker. Now, 
<laughs> if all of my decreases were correct, there should be 50 stitches on this needle. I'm just going to half that. Um, so 25, and then I'm going to knit 25 stitches on this needle. One, two, three, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. I've actually done twenty-six um, for reasons that I'll explain in a minute but aren't especially important. Twenty-five is fine. In any case, it doesn't have to be exactly half as long as it's roughly half of the stitches. And now I'm just going to go ahead and pull my long needle through. So they're sort of midway along the needle now on the cable and I'm going to go and turn my sleeve over. So as you can see, the other stitches are further down on this needle and there's a lot of loose cable before the right needle. And I'm going to go ahead and knit the rest of the stitches like this. Okay, so I finished and I'm just going to get rid of my 40 centimeter needle. I don't need that anymore. Now this is the point where I'm going to start doing a knit one purl one, and this is why I have 26 on one side and 24 on the other. Um, I want both sides to start with a knit stitch when I'm doing the knit one purl one, so it makes sense to have an even number on each side. In any case, it doesn't matter too much. We're now set up to do magic loop, so I'll show you how it's done. So I've knit along these stitches, and next I want to knit along these stitches. I'll just turn the work around so the stitches I want to knit next are on the front, and then I'm going to pull the cable through so that this needle has the stitches that I'm about to knit on it, ready to knit. Then I'm going to pull this needle out of the stitches on the back so that they're sitting in the middle of the cable. And I have a bunch of loose cable here. And now I can go ahead and knit across this side. Like I said, I'm now on the ribbing, so I'm going to knit one purl one along this side. I got to the end of that side, so I'll show you again um, to knit across the other side. So this is the side that I want to knit along next, so I'm going to turn so it's facing me and um, pull the needle through so that it's got the stitches on it, ready to knit. And then I can't use this needle while it's stuck on all these stitches that I've just knitted, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull it through. You do have to be a little bit careful if your first stitch of the next row is a knit stitch, make sure that the yarn stays behind the work. But I'm now ready just to carry on knitting. You can do this for ribbing, you can do this for stockinette. To be honest, if you uh, don't want to even buy 40 centimeter needles for this project, you can actually do all of the 40 centimeter work, including the whole sleeve, um, the collar, and the cuffs. You can do all of it on Magic Loop. And that way you can knit this entire jumper using only the 80 centimeter 5.5 millimeter and 80 centimeter 4.5 millimeter needles. Okay, so here I am with my essentially finished jumper. I'm going to try it on, but there will be a word of warning. This jumper is going to change its fit dramatically when it's washed for the first time. Washing and blocking a jumper, well firstly it will smooth out all your stitches. Any little lumpy bumpy bits from doing the jobless jogs on the stripes or from weaving ends in will become much less noticeable. But perhaps more significantly, all of the ribbing is going to open out a lot, so we're currently it cinches in quite a bit. After blocking, it will cinch much less. When you wash your jumper, um, you can press out some of the water and then lie it flat, and whatever shape you sort of lie it in and let it dry in will be the shape that it takes. So when we try our jumper on now, we can have a look and see which parts we want to focus the most on opening out or compacting or whatever it is to get the fit that we want. I'll just take my hair clip out because this is not going to go over my head otherwise. I think overall it's looking pretty good. I would like the sleeves to be a little bit longer, um, and also obviously I'd like these cuffs to open out, both here and around the waist. I want more of a boxy shape, so this ribbon, when it opens out, I like that fit quite a lot better. It's also a little bit tight in the neck, but again, I'm not too worried because this is going to relax when it's washed. If after washing and blocking I'm still not happy with these cuffs and how far they plant my arms, um, it's not a problem, I'll just undo my bind off knit a few more rows of ribbing and then bind it off again. I have a rinse-free wool wash, but this type of thing isn't really essential. You don't want the water to be hot because it will increase the chance of the jumper felting. To be honest, it's probably not going to happen. You're probably fine, but especially if you think you can't avoid poking it, 
just make the water cool-ish. And then I'm going to leave it here to soak. I don't have a lot of time. Um, I want to start drying it tonight. So I think I'm just gonna leave it in here for like 20 minutes, half an hour. I'll just gently push out some of the air first and then I will step back and leave it alone. <laughs> or at least try my best to. So like I mentioned before, this is really your chance to sort of mold the jumper to be shaped the way you want it to be shaped. I'm just putting it on this table because it's sort of slatted, which will give a little bit more air movement from below and maybe help it dry out a bit faster. But to be honest, a big heavy jumper like this is going to take a while to dry anyway. Be careful about putting it on any surface that it might stain it or it might be damaged by getting a little bit damp. And I'm just going to really go ahead and open up this ribbing and try and give it that boxy straight up and down shape that I want. And that is that. I now have the jumper fully blocked, it's dried out and it's totally finished. So compared to the clip you saw a minute ago where I was wearing the jumper before blocking, you're going to notice that the fit is completely different. Firstly, it's a lot boxier. It doesn't like cinch in at the waist like it did before. And also um, the sleeves are so much longer. They were a bit short on me before, probably about here. So they've grown a whole 10 centimeters with blocking. This is something that's going to vary with the yarn that you're using, um, but it is very easy to undo the bind off and go back and remove or add a bit to the ribbing if needed, if the length after blocking isn't exactly what you want. But yes, I think that's about it. Hopefully you've now finished a cute first, or not first, I don't know, jumper that you're going to get a lot of wear out of, ready for autumn. And I hope you've really enjoyed the process and now feel up for attempting some different knitting patterns that are not written by me or not written for total beginners. I think if you go for any simple pattern now, you should be set to go. There will be techniques that you haven't seen before. You're likely to find some German short rows, some different ways of doing increases. Maybe you're trying a round yoke or something with color work. But each time you knit a new pattern, you can just pick up one or two new skills that that particular garment has required for it. And gradually you'll build up the selection of skills that you can do. And YouTube is full of great resources for how to do specific skills. There are clips everywhere showing specific types of cast-ons, increases, how to do different types of colour work. It's all there for you to find and to try out. I think that's about it. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will be back in soon with another. Goodbye. Now I'm going to show you how to join a new ball of yarn when you run out. This may not work with all yarns, but it will work fine for most. It's called spit splicing, but I don't really feel like spitting on camera, so I have a glass of water here, but I think most people do just sort of spit to do this. Basically, you want to take the end that's attached to your work and you want to sort of unply it a little bit. And then you just want to cut off half of the yarn, so it's half thickness. So if you had a four ply yarn, you could unravel it and cut off two of the plies. Um, if you had a three ply yarn, one end you can cut off two and then you can cut off one, I guess. So I'm just going to grab my new ball of yarn. I'm going to untwist the end of this too. And again, splitting it in half. And then I'm just going to use this to measure it. I'm going to cut it just roughly the same length as the amount I cut off the other strand. So I'm going to take my two ends, both of which are now half thickness, and I'm going to just sort of hold them together. And I want to get them wet. Basically, we're going to be felting these two ends together. Now this is where most people just sort of spit on the yarn ends. <laughs> I don't want to do that, so we're not going to. Just get them slightly damp, and then what you can do is just rub them together in your hands like this. This produces friction and heat, and that is what is needed to felt the yarn together. As you can see, I now have a pretty much seamless join between these two ends. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this when you're changing colour for the stripes, so I'll show you a different way of weaving in the ends afterwards for when you change colour when you're knitting the stripes. So there are some ends which you can't avoid by splicing yarn together. An example of when this could happen is um, your cast on edge and your bind off edge, but also when you do stripes, it might look a bit funny if you try and splice the ends of your yarn together. 
So I'm just going to do a sort of mini demo on how to weave in ends, both in reverse side of stockinette and also in ribbing. So this is my second sample and I've saved a couple of ends. So here I'm going to weave this end from my cast on edge because I did a folded collar into the stockinette. And I'm aware that this jumper perhaps isn't the best example because it's got a lot of mohair and sort of texture going on so you can't see things super clearly. But basically what you want to try to do when you're weaving ends into the wrong side of stockinette is follow the path that the yarn takes when you're knitting. So I'm going to follow this piece here, yeah? And it enters this loop. And then if you look where it goes next, it passes through this loop and into this loop. If you just sort of slide these pearl bumps aside, you can see it a little bit more clearly. So it comes around here, so we're gonna follow that, and it enters this bump here, so we're gonna go in there. And then if you look, it comes out of that bump and into this next bump here, so, like so. Now you'll get more familiar with this pattern, so I'm going to follow this around through around here and it enters this pearl bump and this pearl bump. And what I will say, following it around into here and then here, it doesn't really matter so much, right? Like you can you can totally just weave your ends in any old way and just check on the right side every now and then that it's nothing too obnoxiously obvious, um, and that's fine. But I think this is quite a, a nice looking method because once you have weaved in your ends like this, I think that's enough, so I can now cut it short. It, it's sort of invisible. I mean, it's, it's not invisible because it's sort of double thickness, but in terms of the actual pearl bumps and where they appear, it is invisible. I saved an end on my bind off edge here as well. Just ignore those mohair <laughs> joins, I'll weave those in in a moment. Now. With ribbing, I weave it in in an even simpler way. Basically, you see all these Vs here from the rib. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just insert it into one of the side edges of those Vs, and then say here, this is my right, I'm inserting it into the right leg of each V. I'm just going to keep on inserting the needle through all of the right legs of the Vs in this column, like so. Now when you weave in ends, basically you want to try to ensure that at least once you are changing the direction that the yarn is being woven in. Because that's going to make it much less likely to pull out. So now I'm going to go into one of the adjacent columns of these and just put it through all of the legs on one side of that column, not quite back to the wind off edge but close and then I can trim the end. And again, ignoring the mohair tails, you'll see that in terms of the actual visible stitches, it's invisible. So I wanted to talk briefly about the stripes. I haven't spoken much about the stripes when I was knitting the rest of the jumper because I don't really feel like they contribute too much to the structure of the jumper. You know, you may choose to include stripes, you may choose not to include them, you may do them differently to me. But I'm going to speak a little bit about how I did my stripes so that if anyone wants to recreate that look on their jumper, they know how I did it. My stripes are six rows wide and then there is a 14 row gap in between them. As you can see, after I split the body and sleeves, I just carried that on. So there's 14 rows from here to here and 14 rows from here to here. So when the arm lies by your side, when you're wearing the jumper, the stripes sort of match up with the body stripes. Now, when it comes to actually adding stripes in, it's really quite straightforward. Essentially, um, I'm just going to start knitting with the other colour. I'm just going to slip my stitch marker and then I have my grey yarn here. Just grab the tail of that and start knitting. Now it will be really gappy and messy um, right here I changed but we're going to fix that later. Okay so I have reached the end of the round. You can see my beginning round marker and normally I just carry on knitting these stitches. But this is where I'm going to talk about jogs. Now because we're sort of knitting in a spiral, um, if I just carry on knitting across these stitches, there'll be a little step, see? So this white stitch here will appear next to this grey stitch here that's still on the needle. And therefore you will end up with a sort of place where the stripes don't quite match up. 
Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the stitch below the one on the needle. So you'll see that this grey loop here passes through this white loop. And I'm just going to go ahead and add the white loop onto my needle like this. I'll just do that again so you can see. So this loop here, um, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to have this sort of right leg of the loop be over the front, um, like how a regular stitch is mounted. And then I'm going to knit these two stitches together. Now you can just carry on the seam like normal, just continue knitting in the round. When you change back to the colour, again, it's the first row after um, you change colour. At the end of that row, that's where you're going to do this sort of jobless knitting into the stitch below, I guess. Now, as you can see, this stitch here is now sort of double height on this side and single height on this side. It's a little bit hard to explain, um, but essentially it helps disguise that little bump. Now, this one's extra bumpy because there's a decrease here, um, but you can sort of see that there's no visible jog. In fact, I'll try and find a better one to show you. So this is the back of the neck. This is my first um, yoke stripe. And as you can see, I can't see precisely where the beginning of round is. It's somewhere around here. It does look a little bit bumpy, but that isn't really the end of the world. When we wash and block this jumper, that will be hidden a bit. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I've knitted my, I haven't measured it, but it's probably roughly almost <laughs> eight centimeters of ribbing for the collar. And you'll notice that there's this sort of funny line around the middle. Basically, this is one row where I just purled all the stitches instead of doing ribbing. So I knitted in ribbing, then I purled one round and then continued knitting in ribbing. And the reason why I'm doing that is you can see when I fold this in half, it like really wants to fold along that purl line. It's almost like scoring a sheet of paper so it will fold really easily. And it also gives this nice edge, which will be the finished edge of the neckline. This is optional. If you have reached this point and decided that you want the folded collar, but you haven't done a purl round or you just don't like the look of the purl round, you can just do this with straight ribbing. So what I want to do basically is I want to knit together these live stitches with this cast on edge so that the collar is held like this. So this is a little bit fiddly. You want to make sure that the folded collar doesn't get twisted. So you don't want it to end up like this, where all of your ribbing is going to end up sort of bent round. You want to make sure that the correct ribs match up. So you can see this is an stitch, so it's going to be a purl stitch on the other side, this purl stitch here, this sort of dip. And if I follow it down, this is the point where I want to knit this together with the stitch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert my right needle through the first stitch as if I'm going to knit it and then I'm going to find the corresponding point on the cast on edge which is just here and I'm also going to insert my right needle through the cast on edge. Now I wouldn't worry too much about where exactly what loop you're picking up on the cast on edge um, it's more important that it's just well aligned. So then I'm going to yarn over and I'm going to let both of these fall off the needle so I'm sort of doing a knit two together, but my knit two together is between the live stitch and uh, the corresponding point on the cast on edge. So again, I'm going through the next live stitch, and then this here is the corresponding point on the cast on edge. So I'm just going to grab a stitch there. Now, I find this to be the easiest way for me to do it. However, I know some people struggle with this and what they instead choose to do is use a second, potentially smaller 40 centimeter needle to pick up the correct number of stitches, um, just sort of put loops onto the needle all the way around. So when it comes to doing this knit two together with the live stitches and the cast on edge, they have the cast on edge on another needle and it really does feel like doing a knit two together rather than having to insert the needle and pick up a stitch every time. This is how I find it easier, but feel free to look up or try that technique if you are struggling with this. Okay, so now let's talk German short rows. It's worth noting that you can knit German short rows with the funnel neck or the folded neck, and you can equally do no German short rows with either. So you can combine the two neckline options and the two neck shape options however you want. This is also the trickiest part in this pattern. 
we're going to have some extra techniques introduced to increase on the wrong side. So this is for adventurous beginners, I suppose, but I will walk you through all the steps and I think it is possible for your first jumper if you're good at picking up techniques in pattern. So let's just discuss briefly what we're going to do. We want the front of the neck to be lower than the back of the neck. And to do this, instead of going all the way around, for the first few yoke rows, instead, we're just going to knit as far as the front and then turn around and come back. So there are fewer rows right at the front here where we're not gonna be doing anything and we'll be building up more fabric here around the back. So we're going to knit round and back, 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 round and back. I think um, there'll be a total of six turns for all of the sizes apart from the smaller size where there'll be only four. So um, I'll start off with the setup part and then we'll do the repeat. So, what we're going to do first of all is we're going to begin the first round just like we would be if we were not doing German short rows. My yarn does look a bit funny because this is an interesting yarn with some thick bits and some thin bits. Um, please just try to ignore that. So to start this like we would the regular yoke, what I'm going to do is I'm going to knit up as far as the first marker, then I'm going to be doing my regular increases. I'm going to go up to the second pair of markers and do my regular increases here too. Um, and then I will knit three more stitches. So as you can see, I've just passed the second set of markers. So that's the beginning of round, first set of markers. Second set of markers, I've just done my M1L after the second set of markers. What I'm going to do is knit three more stitches. So that's one, two, and three. And now we are going to turn our work. Now, if you just flip it over and then start purling, what's going to happen is you're going to get a big hole here. And there are a lot of different ways that you can avoid having these holes, a lot of different techniques. There are different types of short rows, you can do a wrap and turn. I'm going to do a German short row because I think it's the easiest and it's also pretty invisible. So anytime you do a German short row, you start off by turning your work and then you want to make sure that the yarn is in the front. As you can see, it already is, so this is fine and we can keep going. Now I'm going to insert my needle as if to purl, but I'm not going to purl, I'm just going to slip stitch. And what I'm going to do now before I start purling is I'm going to bring this piece of yarn round the top and back through to the front. I'll do it again. So it was already in the front. I'm going to bring it round and all the way through. And if I just give it a slight little tug, what you'll see is I end up with this strange stitch. It has two legs on the front and two legs on the back and they're sort of twisted together at the top. That is what you want. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to purl all the way back to the beginning of round. I'm not going to do any increases or anything. I'm just going to purl because this is the equivalent of if you are knitting the yoke without the German short rows. You know how you do one round with increases and then one round without? This purling back to the beginning of the round is the part without. So you can see that I've reached the beginning of round and I'm still working on the wrong side. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to want to go out and back again on the other side. So I want to go past this first pair of markers and the second pair of markers and then turn once on the front. But the thing is I want to still be doing increases on the way out and then no increase on the way back. And what you'll notice is that as we work on the way out, we're now working on the wrong side, which means we're going to have to do our raglan increases from the wrong side. And this is what makes this short row section more difficult than the rest of the pattern. It's not the actual turns themselves, they're quite easy. It's the fact that we're going to have to do our increases from the wrong side. So I'm just going to purl up to the first marker. So I've reached this first marker. If you were working this from the right side, you'd be working it in this direction. So towards the beginning of round this way. And that means that this here would be the first increase you do, which is the M1R. And then this one here would be the M1L. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an M1L from the opposite direction. And this is straight up the hardest stitch in this whole <laughs> jumper tutorial. So this is called an M1LP and it's a left leaning increase on the purl side. I'm just going to pick up the bar from front to back like I would to do an L1L using my left needle. And now this is the tricky bit. We now have to purl through the back loop, 
which means I want to insert my needle from this direction and I want to do it through the back here. So just watch what I do. I want to insert this needle this way. Now can you see? I'm coming in from behind like this and then I'm going to yarn over and pull through. It is tricky and if you are struggling with it that makes total sense. Anyway, now I am going to slip the marker, purl two, slip the second marker in the pair and now I'm going to do an M1 RP which is thankfully much easier. All you're going to do is pick the bar up from back to front and then just purl it like you would any other stitch. So inserting my needle from right to left, yarn over and out. So those are the increases and we're going to carry on and do those increases again on this second pair of markers. I'll show them to you so you get to see them again. So I'm going to purl up to my second set of markers, there we go. And now I'm going to want to pick up the bar from front to back. I'm just going to use my right needle to help pick up that bar, but I'm picking it up with my left needle from front to back. And now I want to enter through the back loop from left to right. I'll do that again. Through the back loop from left to right. Yarn over and pull through. Slip the marker. Pearl the two raglan stitches, slip the marker, and then this is the easier one. Pick it up from back to front and then pearl it like you would any other stitch. Okay, so now I'm almost ready to turn because I'm on the front panel, so I'm going to pearl three more stitches and now I am going to turn. So turn my work. Now you'll notice that the yarn is in the back and like I said to do these German short rows we need to make sure that it's in the front. So pulling it through to the front and then inserting as if to purl and slipping that stitch. I'll just pull this tight, I'm going to tug on it a little and I'm just going to bring it round to the back because we need it in the back ready to knit. And you'll see that once again we have this weird double stitch with two legs here in the front and two legs in the back. And now we can carry on knitting. And basically you just want to keep on knitting with no increases because we increased on the last row on the way out here all the way back to the beginning of round. Okay so I'm back at the beginning of round and I'm going to go out and back again. This section here from here onwards is the section that we're going to repeat to add more short rows. So step one is to knit all the way out um, and do your raglan increases up until you reach the point where you get to that funny double stitch left over from the last time you turned. I've done that and you can see that this next stitch here kind of looks like two stitches from the front but it's got this sort of twist in the top and then the two stitch on the back. This is our funny double stitch from turning last time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat that exactly like I would a regular stitch. We're just going to use it so that we know that that is where we last turned. And all we're going to do after that is knit three more stitches and then turn again. So this next turn is happening three stitches further along than the last one. So I'm turning, the yarn is already in the front, slip the stitch purl wise, bring it round and through and now I am ready to purl. And what I'm going to do is just purl all the way back round to the beginning of the round. So I've reached the beginning of the round, slip the marker, and now basically we want to do the same thing again but from the inside. So we're going to purl while increasing all the way until we reach our funny double turning stitch. And then you want to purl three more stitches after that and then turn and knit without increases all the way back. And that is the repeat. So for the smallest size you will at that point be done with your short rows. For the other sizes I suggest you do one more set. So you'll knit out while increasing, turn and purl back purl out while increasing, um, knit and turn back, each time the turn happening three stitches beyond the previous turn. And at that point you will be done with your short rows. When I've done that I will come back and show you what it looks like. Okay so I'm now done with my German short rows. I'll show you what this looks like. So here at the back you can see we have knitted a little section 
and where there are raglan increase sections, you can see that these increases have been done. But if we turn it around to the front, you can see that we're just at the bottom of the collar. So all of this fabric just sort of tapers out here, which means that the front of this collar is going to sit lower than the sides and the back. From this point onwards, you can pretty much continue exactly like you would with the yoke without the German short rows. However, note that we have done three increase rounds already. So when you're counting increase rounds for the yoke, you have to do three fewer than you would have done if you hadn't done the German short rows. In other words, just consider us having done the first six rounds already. Oh, and I guess that's like two increase rounds and first four rounds already if you're making the smaller size and have only done two sets of German short rows. Other than that, it's exactly the same. There are still two turning stitches um, somewhere out here, these weird double stitches, but basically you can just treat those like a regular stitch and knit across them on the next round and it will be just fine. 